Behaviorists believe that immediate reinforcement is what shapes behavior. Well, forget what you know about Skinner because Rotter and Michelle believe otherwise. The cognitive social learning theory believes that a good understanding of others through day-to-day -day interaction with other people and their environment is what determines people's behavior in a given situation more than immediate reinforcement. Let's take for example Stella. Growing up, Stella was well supported by her parents with everything that she did. She was enrolled in ballet classes as per her request and would sometimes get stubborn when she could not get the position she was learning. However, her parents always encouraged her that good things in life don't come easy. She became persistent and was finally able to achieve it. As a grown-up, Stella decided to go to med school in hopes of achieving her dreams of becoming a doctor. She did not expect it to become this hard and stressful that she found herself on the verge of stopping med school. However, she knew she was not the person to just give up. Stella was instilled with values of not giving up for something that she wanted in life, and she was able to understand this in an environment that made her feel supported in her childhood. Let's first get to know Julian Rotter. Julian Rotter was born in Brooklyn, New York on the 22nd of October, 1916. He's the youngest of three children and was born to a middle-class family, up until the Great Depression, that is. This was what made him concerned for social injustice and taught him the importance of situational conditions affecting human behavior. Roger's social learning theory consists of five basic assumptions. Number one, humans interact with their meaningful environments. Number two, human personality is learned. Number three, personality has a basic unity. Number four, motivation is goal-directed. And finally, number five, people are capable of anticipating events. Let's briefly discuss this one by one. Rogers' first assumption, humans interact with their meaningful environment, just means people's reactions to environmental stimuli depend on the meaning they attach to an event. Rogers' second assumption, human personality is learned, means that he believes personality is not determined by age. For as long as we are capable of taking in new experiences and learning, we are capable of changing and shaping our personality. The third assumption, personality has a basic unity, means that while personality isn't determined by age and can be changed, personality still has relative stability. The fourth assumption, motivation is goal-directed, just means that in general, people behave in a way that brings them toward a goal they would like to achieve. An example of this is a college student taking on more units per term in an effort to graduate earlier than expected. And finally, the fifth assumption is that people are capable of anticipating events. They use their perceived movement in the direction of the anticipated event as a criterion for evaluating reinforcers. Let's take this example. A student's ultimate goal is to become a lawyer. To achieve this goal, the student knows they must finish high school, take up a pre-law course in college, study for and take the PhilSAT, get into law school, and finally pass their bar exam before they can become a lawyer. The main concern Rotter had was a prediction of human behavior. Therefore, he suggested four variables that must be analyzed in order to make accurate predictions about any specific situation. And these variables were behavioral potential, expectancy, reinforcement value, and psychological situation. Let's define these terms. Behavioral potential refers to the likelihood that a given behavior will occur in a particular situation. Let's take this example. In order for a student to receive good grades, one will practice a few potential behaviors such as studying or cheating. The likelihood of these behaviors occurring will either be 0%, 100%, or somewhere in between the two extremities. Expectancy is defined as a person's expectation that some specific reinforcement will occur in a given situation. It is formed based on past experiences. The more often a behavior has led to reinforcement in the past, the stronger the person's expectancy that the behavior will achieve that outcome now. There are two types of expectancies, which are generalized expectancies and specific expectancies. You were given the chance to intern for two big companies. Company A will pay you 5,000 pesos a week, while Company B will pay you 7,000 pesos a week. Which company would you choose? It is more likely that people will choose the salary of Company B. This is what you call reinforcement value. 
It is preference a person attaches to any reinforcement when the probabilities for the occurrence of a number of different reinforcements are all equal. Grotter stated that each individual's experience with the environment is unique. Some people may interpret the same situation differently. It all depends on the individual's subjective understanding of the situation and environment they're in. This is what Rotter defined as a psychological situation. The formula BP is equal to F times E and RV was created by Rotter. BP refers to behavioral potential, which is a function of E, or expectancy and RV, also known as reinforcement value. This formula can help you understand that if BP is high, then E and RV will be more likely high as well. If BP is low, then E and RV will be low as well. Therefore, a behavior will occur if an individual expects a reinforcement making she or he value the reinforcement. Roger believed that people strive for their success because of their generalized expectancy, where he suggested that both the situation and the individual contribute to the feelings and personal control. However, he observed that a lot of people don't really increase their feeling of personal control after experiencing success, and people don't lower their expectancies when faced with continuous failure. To assess people's internal and external control of reinforcement, Rotter developed the IE scale. This scale attempts to differentiate between the belief of people's own efforts versus external factors like environmental consequences. It indicates the degree to which people believe they're in control of their lives. Another generalized expectancy is the concept of interpersonal trust. Rotter defined interpersonal trust as, quote-unquote, a generalized expectancy held by an individual that the word, promise, oral or written statement of another individual or group can be relied on, end of quote. He saw interpersonal trust as a belief in the words of others when there is no reason to doubt. Rotter developed the interpersonal trust scale in order to measure individuals' generalized expectancy of trust and distrust. Rotter's take on individuals with maladaptive behavior are characterized by unrealistic goals, inappropriate behaviors, inadequate skills, or they tend to have unreasonable low expectancies of being able to perform behaviors necessary for positive reinforcement. People who set their goals too high will have a hard time learning productive behaviors because their goals are out of range. Rotter suggested a problem-solving approach to psychotherapy. The goal is to reduce offensive and avoidance behaviors. According to Rotter, there are two basic ways to accomplish this therapeutic goal. First, changing the importance of goals. And the second one is eliminating low expectancies for success. Let us now proceed with Julian Rotter's student, Walter Mitchell. Walter Mitchell was born on February 22, 1930 in Vienna, Austria. He is the second son of upper-middle-class parents. He grew up in a pleasant environment near Freud's home. Walter Mitchell enrolled at Ohio State University in 1953 for his doctoral studies, and Julian Rotter was one of the most influential faculty members that he admired. Mitchell is also an interactionist in that he believes that situation has a more powerful effect on how a person will behave. He called this the person-situation interaction. If I am in this situation, then I do X. But if I am in that situation, then I do Y. This is because Mitchell argues that traits are not essentially the best and only predictors of personality. Our behaviors, according to Mitchell, are dependent in context. Example, here's a short clip from his interview at the 92nd Street Y Community Center. Is that there is much less consistency across situations than has been assumed. That is that the same person who is terrified in the dentist's office may be an incredibly courageous mountain climber. That the same individual is a tremendous uh, entrepreneur and very, very uh, able to deal with complex decision with almost no nervousness uh, can fall apart in social situations. So the, the challenge was that there is very little consistency in who we are when the contexts shift. I'm not suggesting uh, when I say that there is limited, very limited consistency across different situations, I'm not suggesting that the individual is empty of personality. 
there's lots of personality in there, but that it is expressed in contextualized ways. And rather than being thought of as traits that you have or don't, are influenced by things like your expectations, your goals, your values, and your competency. Imagine a student who is very conscientious. He has straight A's, always goes to class early, and even greets his teachers and friends. But when he gets home, he dismisses his parents, his room is untidy and disorganized. Is it because he lacks a conscientious trait? Maybe he is just distant with his parents, or maybe he's disinterested in cleaning his room. Michelle called this the inconsistency paradox. Although traits and dispositions are stable over time, they are sometimes not consistent across different situations. That's why sometimes an extroverted guy may feel incredibly shy over women, which could be due to his unique perspective about girls. Yuichi Shoda and Walter Mischel came up with a system called Cognitive Affective Personality System that considers variations across situations and stability of behavior. The behavior is said to be shaped when one's personal disposition interacts with a person's belief, values, goals, cognition, and feelings. They came up with a framework similar to Mischel's theory of person-situation interaction. If A, then X, but if B, then Y. Example, if Rachel is confronted by her friends, she justifies her actions, but if she is confronted by her parents, she stays quiet. Michelle and Shoda also observed that there is a pattern of variability in behavior, and they call it behavioral signature of personality, which is one's consistent way of varying his or her behavior in different situations. Walter Mischel proposed five relatively stable person variables that interact with the situation in order to determine the behavior, and it is called the cognitive affective units. These units include people's encoding strategies, competencies and self-regulatory strategies, expectancies and beliefs, goals and values, and affective responses. The first cognitive affective unit is encoding strategies, which refers to the way people categorize information from external stimuli. These information are then transformed into personal constructs through cognitive processes. It is important to keep in mind that every person is unique, which means that people have different ways of encoding events or experiences. The second cognitive affective unit is competencies and self-regulatory strategies. Competencies are the beliefs that we have on ourselves, our plans, and capabilities when establishing behaviors. Self-regulatory strategies are used to control behavior through setting goals for themselves and producing consequences. This could actually help students who are struggling with online studies because there are so many temptations and distractions that they would rather do at home than actually study. That is why Michelle believes that if we try to learn and strengthen these strategies through practice, we can improve our self-regulation, our discipline, and our capacity to delay rewards and gratification. Our expectancies and beliefs also determine how we will act in situations. For example, if a student used a self-relaxation technique before she took an exam and it gave her a good score on the test, she is more likely to continue to use that same technique in other exams in the future. A person's goals and values may also affect his or her personality and actions across different scenarios. These cognitive affective units are one of the most stable units among others because they are attached with our emotions. Values instilled and internalized throughout our lives are hard to detach. For example, patriotic values may be associated with security and love for one's own country, which leads one person to express his concern for the country through joining community cleanups. Lastly, the affective responses pertain to feelings, emotions, and physiological reactions. This cognitive affective unit is rather dependent and cannot be separated from other units. It influences other units in a way that, for instance, an individual self-concept includes certain positive and negative feelings. To summarize, these cognitive affective units are stable qualities interacting with different situations that predict or affect how we will behave. 
They are not necessarily independent, but rather interdependent at times, depending on the circumstances.